Ladies and gentlemen, young men and women, Mr. Ambassador of the United States in Portugal, uh, Dr. Robert Sherman, uh, Professor Dava Newman, our guest of honor, Professor Guillermo Trotti, it's a pleasure to receive you here in the main hall of Instituto Superior Técnico in Lisbon. We have many events here and many times we have difficulty filling them in with people. But there are two matters that always get this room filled up to capacity. One of them is space. Every time we have something about space flight, the problem is keeping the people out of the room. So thank you very much for coming here to talk to us about space. The other one, just for the record, is every time we have a talk about free software. Free software also <laughs> fills our rooms. All other topics, this is a big room, all other topics usually we have to go around uh, picking up students and professors to come around. I don't know what this means, so don't ask me. So. <laughs> well, but it's, it is a pleasure to introduce you today, Professor Davon Newman. I have here a, a, a biography, or a, well, a short biography of her, but if I were to read it, we'll not have the time to listen to the talk, so I won't read, I won't read it. I'll just point out a few highlights. Professor W. Newman is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, currently in leave as an ASA deputy administrator. She has a, a degree from the University of Notre Dame in aerospace engineering and a PhD degree in technology and policy in 1992 from MIT. She has a list of honors and awards that is too long to read, but I will point out the most interesting ones, or at least the ones I found more curious. She was Professor of the Year at the University of uh, Houston ASM chapter in 1993. Uh, she was the MIT Margaret McVicker Faculty Fellow in 2000 and, the, and the, the award for women in aerospace in 2001. She also has the world record for women's human-powered hydrofoil speed in 1991. Did I understand this correctly? And she is an avid sailor. This is not in the paper, but I know this. And she has sailed the world. I don't know if totally around the world or not, but definitely a very long sail voyage around the world. Uh, she is a member of many technical societies, including the Society of Women Engineers, the American Society for Engineering Education, the International Society of Biomechanics, Sigma Chi, the International Research Honor Society, and the Space Studies Institute, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. She has been Assistant Professor of Aeronautics and Aerospace from 1993 to 1995 at MIT. As I said, the, uh, the, the Margaret McClicker Faculty Fellow in 2000 and the Director of the Technology and Policy Program between 2003 and 2015. She was also the uh, coordinator of the Portugal MIT program until recently, until she left to become NASA Deputy Administrator, the position she's, uh, she's holding now uh, on leave from MIT. As you may have understood by, from this, she, her research interests include aerospace biomedical engineering, uh, biomechanics, control and dynamics, human factors in space travel, engineering systems and design, and space policy. It is a pleasure to welcome you here. I'm looking forward to listen to your talk. Thank you very much for coming to IST. Thank you very much and hello IST. It's wonderful to be here. I'm also visiting for Professor IST. I'd love to, as I say, come home and see you all. It's been uh, wonderful to join NASA and um, I'm looking forward to taking you all on a trip and telling you about some of our plans for going to Mars. First I start with the educational piece. So I believe that art and science are along the same axes. There's actually a lot of scholarship in art and science, how we can benefit um, one from the other. And I 
in kind of STEM, you might have heard of. We have a, the President's Initiative in STEM, which I 100% support. Science, technology, engineering, math is the, the future. The US, the future of Portugal, if we invest in these disciplines so that we can be competitive, we can be innovative, but we also need to be creative and resourceful. And as an engineer, we're always in the service of humanity. So I've put in the arts into STEM, and I've also put in D for design specifically to get the next generation because there's a new generation of little makers out there. I go and speak and I see all these kids and they're making 3D prints and now at NASA we're doing 3D additive manufacturing actually with materials for our next, our next rockets coming up that I'll tell you about. So I challenge many of you here, knowing that I have many engineers and scientists in the audience, to also think about the axis of design and engineering. I think if we looked at this picture, this is after uh, Rich Gold, then we could actually maybe take a holistic approach because the societal problems that we're addressing are very vast and, and getting humans to Mars is um, kind of the next great leap. So I, I start with this picture in terms of the intersections of art, science, design, and, and engineering and how we're all better. We can all become more excellent if, if we work across these disciplines. And I want to take you on a bit of a history of, of how art design inspired NASA in the last 50 years. This is a Robert Rauschenberg of Sky Garden. This was in the 1960s, 69, before we had actually gotten, as we were just approaching in the Apollo program, getting to the moon. So the artists are the visionaries, and Norman Rockwell. So the artists are the ones who tell the stories. They tell about our technology and engineering successes, but they paint the pictures for all of humanity to see. First Steps by Mitchell Jameson. This one, a copy of it, hangs in my office at NASA. <laughs> and again, you're seeing the artists out front painting the pictures, having, having humans you know, envision what's it like, and Andy Warhol. So over all the last 50 years of exploration, the artists have helped us tell the story of expanding the humanity, expanding our, our dreams to, for space travel. And with Eileen Collins, the first female commander of the space shuttle, as photographed by Annie Leibovitz. So I'm going to start here with a, a video to show you quickly um, 50 years that w NASA has already been on Mars with our rovers and robots. So I'd like to take you a quick, uh, quick shot at the history of uh, Martian exploration to, to date.
NASA in our Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. Well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of Curiosity will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. I just wanted to call and say congratulations to the entire Mars Science Laboratory team and really all of JPL. You guys should be remarkably proud. This has been the last 50 years of discovery and exploration, and now we have a, a bit of a map here to show you what our journey of Mars entails for the next two decades. We're here on International Space Station. We're making all of the technology and scientific investments we possibly can. And we call this being Earth Reliant. We just celebrated 15 years of continuous human habitation on space station. We've been living in low Earth orbit for the last 15 years with astronauts from all over the world buying down the human health risks, making sure our astronauts are safe, and investing in the technologies and demonstrating them in the microgravity environment that take us to the next phase. The next phase being the proving ground. This is when we get back to Earth-Moon orbit. So humanity needs to get back to lunar orbit and the moon, and we have our space launch system, that's our heavy lift launch vehicle, to take us there. It's real, it's being constructed, it's 8.4 meters in diameter and uh, 61 meters tall. It's twice the height of the Tower of Belém. So it is a really powerful rocket to get us into deep space, and the Orion capsule will be on top. So we'll be in Earth moon orbit in the 2020s while we're still sending our robots out to Mars to keep getting more data all the time and then by the 2030s we will get to the Mars vicinity in orbit and then land with us onto the, the red planet. There's a lot of pieces we're investing in but we're looking forward to partnerships. We're saying, where's the world? This is a global exploration endeavor. And we're looking forward to the European Space Agency and many other world space agencies to say, we want to have, we want to have the lander for Mars. So we'll get you there on our SLS. And we want to have some scientific instruments on these vehicles. And we want to have this part of the landing when you finally do get to Mars. So it really is a partnership. It's, it's a call for a partnership around the world because exploration is really a global endeavor and is for all of humanity when we finally succeed in getting humans to be the first to step on Mars. Now why are we going to Mars? To search for the evidence of life. Recently we found water. We knew there was ice at the Martian poles, but now we have running water. When you look for life, you follow the water. And so it's very salty. And last week you saw an image of MAVEN. Our MAVEN Mars spacecraft just helped us explain if Mars and Earth are both 4.5 billion years old, could have Mars had life? And if Mars had life, what went so terribly wrong? Because all of our exploring really helps inform us about life here on Earth. If Mars had life, what went so terribly wrong? And we have a little bit of a hint from last week, the MAVEN helped explain how did Mars lose its atmosphere. Mars has 1% of Earth's atmosphere. So we think of Mars today as a cold, dead place. But it looks like the solar winds basically helped extrapolate, take away the Martian atmosphere. So every day, every week, we're getting more information from all of our rovers and our orbiters. So we're studying Mars over the decades in preparation to, to send our humans there. It's in our strategic plan. You can download this Journey to Mars document from our, our website. I just wanted to give you the, the URL there. And the objective one is to expand human presence into the solar system on the surface of Mars and advance exploration, science, innovation, 
and benefits to humanity and international collaboration um, from the President's directive. So we're realizing President Obama, you know, 2010 Administrative Executive Declaration to get humans to uh, the surface of Mars again. Uh, the technical, the scientific feats are to serve and to be for the benefit of humanity and to do it as a global endeavor. I wanted to show you this not to read, but it's a really important kind of infographic I have. Here's the world, all of the world's missions in rovers trying to get to Mars. Mars is really far away. It's really hard to get to. So you can see, I just showed you in the video, the NASA missions, but these are all the, the world missions. These are the Russian missions early in the 1960s. When you see the red X, it was a mission failure. And we started having some success. The so blue were the NASA missions. We had failures as well, but then with Mariner. And then we had Voyager. So now we're flying by Mars, getting the first very low resolution images, but we're making progress with some successes and flybys. We keep trying. We try to get into orbit. Now we've orbited, but it's very hard to land. So there's a few more failures, both, both Russian and, and American. But you see the blue. We have more successes and more successes. Now all of a sudden, the Viking landers, both of them, one and two, they make it in the, in the 1970s. We still keep trying. Now other, other folks, Japan starts, the European Space Agency, India, everyone's using their technology. We're starting to build international collaboration and cooperation. And now we start having more success. We want everyone to succeed. And there's a great story here with a mission for the Indian Space Agency on the first attempt for their orbiter at a very affordable price. They got an orbiter at to Mars. Uh, from NASA, we provide the navigation and the control, and most importantly, our deep space network that comes out of the US, but we have stations, of course, in Spain and Australia. So every mission that the humanity, any, any nation, any space nation sends to Mars, we want it to succeed, and we'll try to empower that, because again, we think it's for everyone, and we want to facilitate that. Next exciting missions for Europe are the ExoMars missions coming up now in 16 and 18. So really is um, kind of global, you know, world cooperation to, to get to Mars with rovers, um, orbiters, and then eventually the first humans. Knowing this was an engineering crowd, I know this is busy, I'm not going to explain uh, this chart, but I wanted to, I think I have some aerospace engineers, I wanted to show you the, a bit of the orbits and, and what our plan entails. Uh, again, we're in, we're in low Earth orbit, we'll have the space launch system, and then we'll be orbiting the moon, we'll be practicing, we'll be learning things, going back to the moon. And other nations might want to have the lander that actually goes down to the moon. Uh, for, for NASA, we can't afford that, keeping our goal, the horizon goal is Mars, then we want to learn everything we can and we're glad to give folks a ride into Earth-Moon orbit and we hope someone else will lead and maybe have a lander that goes to the moon. So we will keep demonstrating the technologies. Here's the trades we have. When we get to cis-lunar, we have different trades that we need to understand. Habitat, life support systems. When you're close to the moon, you're days to weeks away from Earth. Um, Guy and I, as mentioned, sailed around the world and when you're going out for a daily cruise, you're hours to come back to shore. When you circumnavigate the Earth on a sailboat, you get in the middle of the Pacific, as we did, and we lost our steering and hydraulics, you're days to weeks away from survival. So that's kind of this Earth-Moon orbit. When we get to Mars, you have to be completely Earth independent. Completely Earth independent. So we need much better autonomous systems. Our technical systems, we want to have really proven, in the proving ground, to enable that, those first Mars missions. So that's how we get there. We might also go into orbit. We might visit uh, the moons of Mars and then finally with, with a lander. But right now we're looking at all these different trades and doing the engineering analysis so that we can buy down the risks and then, and then get there and succeed. We've learned a lot from the past 50 years of Mars, so I put this up. What are we looking to do in the immediate future with our robotic precursors, our robots that are gonna be there and the landers that are gonna be on Mars in the 2020s? All of the, the pictures here show you what we still have to learn about. I'll point out advanced entry, descent, and a landing. We can do that with rovers. That's about one, one uh, metric ton. 
but a human mission might be 20 metric tons, 40 metric tons. So it's at least, you know, and it goes as a logarithmic scale. So this is very hard. We haven't ever demonstrated it for the type of technologies that we need to. In situ resource development, that's living off the land. When we get to Mars, you can't bring everything with you. All explorers in history who have been successful, they put out their caches. It's like if you're camping, you put your food ahead. We need our fuel stations ahead of us. The fuel station has to already be on Mars so that we know we can get our astronauts home. And what can we do? It's instead of the MakerBot, on Mars we need the MakerBot, but you have to make the MakerBot. So we're getting to Mars to go to the basalts, but you have to make the maker, and then the maker can help you do your spare parts and things like this. So it's quite exciting when you're an engineer. Is it challenging? But these are all the things that we're thinking about, we're investing in. We need to learn, again, much more about these different technologies and, and investments. So that's what we do in the 2020s with, with continuous uh, rovers and landers. And again, it's not to have you read this, it's just to show you that We've learned many things in orbit with when we capture and we do it ascent, uh, entry, descent, and landing, and then what do we do on the surface? But I just put this up here to say there's much, much more to learn. On the bottom, we still have to learn more about the orbital environment. For instance, this is in situ resource. Is it feasible? Can we live off the land to some extent? How about high-powered solar electric propulsion? It's a great way not to get people there. It's a great way to get your cargo and let's say put your fuel caches if we could do it with solar electric propulsion. Other things we need to learn. All, most of all of these are getting landing on the Martian surface, entry, descent, landing, and then ascent. How do we get off the surface? And then when we're finally there, then this now life support systems. And do we have enough power? And what about our navigation? There's no GPS constellation around Mars. So again, you have to think about maybe going back to sailing, going about how early navigators, we triangulated here and we have to put out beacons. We'll have to do something like that on the initial Mars mission. So we still have a lot to learn, the technologies and investments, we can, we can try to prototype them, demonstrate them and here on Earth, but then we're going to really have to prove it in cislunar space to enable um, the Mars missions to come. As I said, it's from the President, um, by the mid-30s, the um, order to return, to get um, people in orbit to Mars and to return them safely to Earth and then followed by a Mars landing. It's hard. It's not quite impossible. I think it's a possible, a possible dream, especially if we do it together. So we're going to go there, we're going to land, and then different than Apollo, eventually people, I believe, will live on Mars and will have an interplanetary species. That's way out. But we're going to just facilitate the first steps because the private industry is very important here. But we go, as I mentioned, the space launch system is uh, NASA's investment into the heavy lift rocket to get us back into deep space. And a whole bunch of wonderful technology in terms of solars and things like that that we're testing. Landing is tricky with this type of mass. So we're testing parachutes, we're testing something called balutes, kind of like donuts, and um, the safety of coming in, and coming in not too hot, uh, because of course the safety of the equipment and the crew is at stake. And then, how are we going to live there? Well, we need enhanced communications. Laser communications is a technology we're investing in right now. We have to recycle all of the water, all of the air, to 100%. We do this on space station, but we don't fully close the loops. We're pretty good at the air and the water, but we really need maybe a breakthrough in technology to get systems that are completely um, reliable and we can close the loops on Mars. New, you know, there's not batteries on, on Mars, right? We can take our RTGs with us, kind of space batteries, but we need a new source. We're thinking about power generation. And then finally, um, you love something to eat. So we look at biological life support systems and we're currently um, growing. These, this is a real picture actually from Space Station. The astronauts are harvesting and eating lettuce that they grow. It's pretty wonderful to see a living plant, any living plant, when you're closed into the Space Station or a vehicle that's kind of the size of your bathroom. You know, the Mars mission is just under four years. About two years round trip and travel and about 500 days on the surface. So it would be pretty spectacular if we can grow and learn to bring some of this capability, you know, in situ and, and do that with us in the habitats when we finally get to Mars. There's nothing like seeing, you know, a growing plant and then being able to harvest it. 
So you can take a look at this. This is what we think the evolution of a Martian is. It's a little bit, we have lots of practice with our rovers and our orbiters, but I, but I like this new, new picture we came up with, but eventually, again, we call, it, we call it boots on Mars. I want to take you even further out into the, beyond the solar system, if you'll allow me. And because um, it's so exciting, and we just celebrated our 20 years of exoplanets. Now, no one knew what an exoplanet was 20 years ago, so this is how fast science and astrophysics uh, contributes to our knowledge of not just our universe, but the entire galaxy and beyond. So it was postulated that there would be exoplanets out there, distant planets, and we can see them. We measure kind of a Doppler shift. Essentially, if they're around a sun and they transit, this is a transiting, and there's a little blip in the signature. Ha ha, there's a planet out there. Now, first, these were huge planets the size of, of Jupiter that we could measure. A Kepler telescope went out. It's basically an exoplanet finding telescope. And now, today, we have found over a thousand exoplanets. There's two other thousand that we need to categorize, but 25 of those are what we call in the sweet spot. They could be habitable. So we have about 25 exoplanets. We can look for Earth-like planets that might be habitable in the future. So we've seen, we know that they're there, we see the signature, are they rocky, are they gaseous, and um, now to have some fun, the very first one was called 51 Pegasi B, we call it 51 Peg, the very first exoplanet <laughs> discovered uh, 20 years ago. And, but we don't know what it looks like. We just have the scientific evidence that it passed by in its retrograde orbit and see it. So some, some artists said, here NASA, you know, and they work at JPL, why don't we help you envision? Why don't we help you tell the world? Your, this story is so good, we want to help you tell it because it doesn't work when you tell the public, well, we know there's exoplanets out there, we can't show you what it looks like, we just have a little blip on our computer chart that we know what it looks like. So here's uh, the artist, actually the designers had some fun. The second exoplanet planet is a super earth it's called you see the number up there HD and this would have eight times the gravity of earth so we call it a super earth it's really probably much closer to the size of Jupiter so they had fun trying to pick this Kepler 16b is um, it's a it's a planet maybe you've seen this in science fiction it's kind of where science fiction becomes science fact Kepler 16b actually has two stars so in our Sun we have one but this is a system that actually Kepler B, it, it um, orbits around two stars, two suns it has. So you get a double shadow. Kepler 18.6f um, says it's always redder. So here we know the light signature coming back. So rather than our beautiful blue, our blue sky and, blue, and sunset and our green plants, if photosynthesis would ever happen on something like a Kepler, um, plants might look red. It might look like it has a lot of iron because it's, photosynthesis would have to evolve on this planet completely different. It would be much more to the red wavelengths than the, than the blues. And then a very interesting new exoplanet, um, PSO, you can see J, J1318.5-22. Uh, they don't have very simple names. The wonderful thing about this exoplanet is it does not orbit a star. It does not have a sun. It doesn't orbit a sun. Now we're finding planets that are orbiting planets, but that they have no sun. And they're probably very dark and cold. So now I want to bring you back in to the International Space Station just to share with you what the astronauts are doing. Six astronauts in space on International Space Station, 400 kilometers up, going in orbit every 90 minutes so they get to see a sunset and a sunrise every 90 minutes. So pretty spectacular views from International Space Station and of course looking down on Earth. So here's an astronaut taking a kind of a beautiful photo of himself in a suit, in an extravehicular activity suit and here's another image of the aurora borealis, the northern lights and the southern lights. There's no artificial colors here. This is really what the northern and the southern lights look from space station. So you look down on Earth and you see you know, a magnificent planet. You see, we like to call it spaceship Earth that we're all inhabiting. Very, very precious. The atmosphere that we live in this is what keeps us alive, that little strip. If, if I took Earth and shrunk it down to a basketball size, we're going to shrink it to a soccer ball size here. <laughs> so if I have a soccer ball and shrink Earth, 
our atmosphere that keeps us all alive, our life support system, the reason that we don't need spacesuits here on Earth, to my shrunken Earth, would be three human hairs. Take Earth, shrink it to this size, our entire life support system would be the diameter of three human hairs. That's how precious our life support system is, you know, in this beautiful blue pale dot, this spaceship Earth that we live on. So we have a, here's even a better, here's even a better picture of the atmosphere. They're keeping us alive and well, and the lights from space are spectacular. Also, looking at the weather, we have three Earth observation instruments now looking at weather, hurricanes, clouds, monitoring climate change, looking at pollution, because the view from orbit is quite spectacular. So we look out into the heavens, but we also look down to our home planet to make a lot of Earth, Earth science and data measurements. This is actually an enhanced um, from Don Pettit. It is an image from Station, and then he changed uh, his exposures. He has a whole book of these. Now, now science kind of becomes art. So we kind of have Earth as, as art because it's such a beautiful planet. We come up with these beautiful... This was just taken by astronaut Scott Kelly. It reminded me of a Rothko painting and uh, abstract. He just took this from Space Station. Scott Kelly is on his one-year mission with Mikhail Korienko, his colleague. So an American and a Russian up there for one year together. There's six crew total and they're on their eighth month. And Scott Kelly has an identical twin, Mark Kelly, former astronaut here on Earth, back home in the U.S. And we're running the first genomics, a genetic experiment between the two identical twins, one in space for over a year, the other one a former astronaut on shuttle missions. And we can really look for the first time at the genetics. It's a really incredible science. That will, I know it's only an N of two, but this will help us in the future because the future, we really do look for personalized medicine and making sure that we can protect and keep the astronauts as healthy as possible on this you know, outrageous next mission and jump to the, to the red planet and get folks to Mars. And then I actually want to end my comments to show you uh, this image. It's my new screensaver. And what this is, it's not Photoshop. Uh, it's, this is Earth, again, spaceship Earth, the blue planet. And that is moon transiting. That's the moon transiting the Earth. And how come we can take this is, jump on our website, please. We have um, the Discover mission, and it's an L1. If you know your orbital mechanics and the Lagrangian point, it's a wonderful place to go. So we have our satellite in L1 at the Lagrangian point, and every month then you'll see moon transverse Earth. So it gives us images every day, and it's called the EPIC camera, E-P-I-C, and there's a download and there's an app, and you can have EPIC on your, on your iPhone, and every day in real time you get the information that, that we have from the EPIC camera. And so once a month you'll be able to see the moon uh, transiting across Earth. If you want to come, you know, take a, take a look from space down to Earth, this is, this is my favorite one. And so um, I enjoyed speaking with you all. It's uh, my pleasure to be here in, in such a packed room. And um, I think uh, if we have time, I'd be happy to answer some questions.